Hey, what's up, YouTube? It's Richie from Boston. Today is the 5th of December. It's 2018, and seeing how the, the entire earth has closed down to memorialize George Herbert Walker Bush's passing, I thought it would be a good time to talk about the Antichrist and other things Antichrist-related. And when I think of things like that, there's no one that comes to mind any quicker than Edward Hendry, AntichristConspiracy.com. Edward, how are you do how are you handling the loss of George Herbert Walker Bush on this sad, somber day? Very well, thank you. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. So we I did a I did a live stream and I did another video. We did two videos. We covered the Jesuits, we covered the Flat Earth, and there was a lot of questions, and you were gracious enough to come back. Um let me, this is the, this is the one question. I mean, if I'm going to take all of them and put them in a nutshell, the one question was, how is the flat earth laid out in the Bible and why is it important? Can you, can, do you have anything to, to, to put up on that? Okay. Well, yeah, that's a, that's, that, that's a good question. So let's, let's start with the basic premise of what the Bible sets forth and this, the reality that we live in uh, today. So the Bible makes it clear that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, all right? But there is spiritual wickedness in high places, all right? And so we, we have to understand that, that we are against certain spiritual forces, okay? And we have to have the full armor of God. And part and parcel of that full armor of God is the truth, you have to gird around with the truth, okay? So let's look at what the Bible says, which is pure truth uh, about God's creation. So in, if you, if, and I'm going to give citations to the Bible so that people can look in their own Bible and see for themselves that what I'm saying is true, all right? So the, we're gonna, going to look at the Bible and let it speak for itself. This is God's word. So in First Chronicles 16.30, it says, Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it, sh that it be not moved. Okay? So right there, it says that the earth be not moved. And let's look at Psalms 93.1. It says, The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established, it is established that it cannot be moved. So here we have two passages that make it clear that the earth is immovable, and it's immovable very much like God. All right. So let's look at another passage in Psalms 104 uh, uh, in verses one through five. All right. Here they talk about the praise and glory of God. And the earth is immovable, and that is closely associated with the praise and glory of God. So, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and glory. And then later, uh, in verse 5, it says, who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. So, the, the glory of God is closely associated with his creation. OK, and in fact, uh, if you look at Romans chapter one, verse 20, it says that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So basically, he reveals to us who he is. OK, we understand the invisible things of God by those things that he has created. That's what Romans 1.20 means, okay? So if you have a false concept of what creation is, then you're also going to have a false concept of who God is, see? So it's important to be accurate in your understanding of God's creation. And all things were created by Jesus Christ for him. Um, if you look in uh, Colossians, uh, chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, it makes it clear, for by him, that is by Jesus, were all things that are created, all things that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, okay? All things were created by Jesus Christ. 
Okay, so if you if you believe in a creation that does not exist, that is, if you have a false concept of God's creation, then you necessarily believe in a creator that does not exist. So if you, however, have an accurate view of God's creation, you will in turn have an accurate view of God. All right. And this is important because we have people who purport to be Christians uh, one, let's take Francis Collin, for instance. He's a, a medical doctor and a, a PhD. And he is the, or was the director of the National Institute of Health. Okay. And he believes in the science of evolution. Let's take, for example. And his, his contention is that, that evolution is based on science and the Bible is not intended to be a textbook on science. Okay. But that's not that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that whatever is depicted in the Bible is God's truth, okay? Uh, in Psalms 119, 128, verse 128, it says, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. So that is everything in the Bible is correct. And if so-called science, and that's what we'll call it, so-called science, which is really more of a religion today because it's not based on empirical evidence, okay, so-called science uh, contradicts God's word, then there's a problem because Jesus made it clear in John chapter 3, verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And basically he's saying, listen, am I telling you about things that are on earth? Okay. That is in his word. Then, and you don't believe me. How are you going to believe me if I tell you about heavenly things? And by the way, that's why we have many of these uh, churches that claim to be Christian churches. Their theology is all screwed up. It's all backwards. Okay. And I, that, that's a, that's a discussion for another day because they have a skewed view of God's creation, and therefore a skewed view of who God really is, all right? Uh, his, his character, his nature. So the Genesis account of creation uh, is, uh, is God's account of how he created the earth. And, and Jesus makes it clear in John chapter 5, verses 46 and 47, that if, if or had ye, he's talking to the Jews now, had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So Moses wrote Genesis, and he's saying, listen, if you're not going to believe what Moses said, okay, you're not going to believe what I say. And that's just, that, that can be said to Christians today who reject the account of God's creation in Genesis. If you don't believe what Moses said in Genesis, you're not going to believe what Jesus said. You're going to have a skewed view, a different view of what Jesus said. You can't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ without believing the creation account in Genesis. Clear and simple. Uh, and in, in, in 2 Corinthians 11.4, uh, uh, Paul wrote, uh, For he that cometh preaches an, uh, another, if he that cometh preaches another Jesus. So keep in mind, just because they use the word Jesus doesn't mean it's the Jesus of the Bible. Right. Because there is another Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11.4 says, If a person preaches another Jesus that we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which is not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So they were concerned back then about the corruption of the gospel, which we see happening. Okay, And part and parcel of that is this idea that, in fact, the earth is a globe. And that it's spinning at a thousand miles per hour at the creator and at the, at the equator, and that it's it's now revolving around the sun, okay, at at breakneck speed at sixty six thousand six hundred miles per hour, okay. That that concept is not found anywhere in the Bible, and we'll talk about that uh, as I get into the passages which speak directly to God's creation. Because God states in Psalms 104.5, he laid the foundations of the earth that shall not be removed forever. So if there's no foundation, that is, if the earth is hanging, if the earth is in the midst of this, uh, this mythical uh, vacuum of space, then there, then there can't be the God of the Bible. There has to be something else, okay? So if you look at Psalms 19, 1 through 6, 
The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth its handiwork. So here we go. God's the, the heavens, okay, declare God's glory. You have to understand what the heavens are showing. And the firmament, there has to be a firmament because it it shows his handiwork. And in that passage, it talks about the um, day unto day, it uttereth speech. Night after night, it showeth knowledge. Okay, there is no speech, no nor knowledge, where their voice is not heard. Okay, everybody can see the magnificence of God's creation and therefore the magnificence of God. And part of that, if you if you look at Psalms 19, 1 through 6, is the circuit that the, that the sun travels around the earth. It, it talks about it. It's a circuit. A circuit is a continuous circular route. OK, so the Bible states that the sun is traveling in a circuit. All right. It's not that the earth is revolving or, 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 or revolving around the sun. No, it's that the sun is traveling in a circuit over a flat stationary earth. OK. Uh, and it shall not be moved. In Psalms 96, 10, it says, if the, if, the, if the earth can't be moved and the sun is careening through space, that means the sun will be flying away from the earth. So the argument is, uh, some people say, well, this path, the sun in Psalms 19, uh, verses 1 through 6, ex- travels in a circuit, explains it travels in a circuit. What is a circuit? A circuit is a continuous circular route that starts and ends at the same place. That's what a circuit is. And so now some would argue, oh, well, this circuit that they're referring to that the sun travels in is the circuit of the sun through the Milky Way. They think, aha, we've got it there. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Uh, Psalms 96.10 states, the world also shall be established that it shall not be moved, which means if the sun is moving and the earth shall not be moved, That means that the sun would be careening away from the earth, okay, which doesn't work. It doesn't work. So that is not the biblical model. The biblical model is a stationary flat earth with foundations, okay, and and that the sun is traveling in a circuit over that flat earth, okay? Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 1. We have the earth created on the first day. All right. And then if you look at Genesis chapters 14 uh, or verses 14 through 19, the sun was not created until the fourth day. So how can you have the earth be a globe created on the first day? And yet the sun that it's supposed to be uh, revolving around is not created until the fourth day. What's the earth doing in the meantime? How is there day and night without the sun that, that it's supposed to be spinning around. See, it makes no sense. And the sun and moon are both lights. So what we have, if you look at uh, Genesis 1, chapter 14 through 16, God says that let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. Okay, so we have lights. There's two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. So we have the greater light, the sun, ruling the day, and we have the lesser light, the moon, okay, ruling the night. Now, they were not created until the fourth day. There was day and night before the sun and moon were created. So how do you have day and night before the sun and moon are created when they're supposed to be the the sun is supposed to be the light of the day and the moon is supposed to be the lesser light at night? How is that possible? Well, if you are out. Um, before dawn, okay, that is before the sun actually comes above the horizon, you will notice that before the sun actually uh, comes above the horizon, there is light in the sky. Yes, there is. (laughs) And if you look under parked cars, you will see that that light does not cast a long shadow as as you would expect from the sun coming up over the horizon, but the shadow is straight down. And in fact, it's only under parked cars that you see a shadow or only under under overhangs that are close to the ground. Otherwise, you see no shadows. And in fact, in Hollywood, they use that time. That's their they call that their magical hour that they like to do a lot of outdoor filming because there are no shadows. And the reason is because the light is coming straight down from the sky. That is, there is a second source of light. And I illustrate that in my book. So 
in my book, The Greatest Lie on Earth, I go through and explain, and I have photographs showing this. And in fact, even after the sun comes up, and now it's casting long shadows, and I have seen this, and you can see this as well. Uh, many times you'll see houses will have long shadows going across the street. Well, those shadows will cover, let's say, a car that's parked in front of that house. You will see a shadow within a shadow. So you'll have the shadow of the house over the car, and then underneath the car, you will see another shadow. And that's that. there are two sources of light. You have the light from the sun, and then you have the light from the sky, which is the light that God had when he had night and day. So the uh, the sun is a greater light that rules the day, but it's not the only light. The Bible makes it clear that there was day and night for four days before God created the sun. And you can see the evidence of that by looking around, by observing well, that's, and I have, that's by the way, I want to give credit to I want to give credit real quick to Rory Cooper for uh, for making that point. And I I um, uh, he he does an excellent job. Uh, he has my perspective uh, YouTube channel. He's got a lot of good stuff. Yeah, um, I just want to give credit to Rory Cooper because it was a video I I watched uh, that he did that showed the different. Uh, uh, different lighting that you would have if there was not a second source of light coming from above. So I, uh, you should look at Rory Cooper's work on that. It's fantastic. Uh, now, the, the, the book of Genesis, uh, and he has a website uh, or a, a YouTube channel called My Perspective. Uh, and his, uh, some of his older videos are still up and in, in, on YouTube as well. Uh, but he's, he does an excellent job. Now, uh, let's look at the idea of what is the sun and uh, the sun and moon. They're both lights, okay? So there were two lights, all right, one to be the greater light, the, the other to be the lesser light, okay? And they are actually lights. So the moon is not reflecting the sun, uh, the light of the sun. The moon has its own light, and that can be demonstrated uh, by taking the a, a thermometer, you can use an infrared thermometer, uh, and they're they're like 50 bucks. You can, and they're great. You can you can point them at an area, and it'll tell you what the temperature of what it is that you're pointing at. Uh, you can buy them on Amazon, uh, hardware stores. They're fantastic. And so if you take the temperature of an item, it could be the asphalt. It could be uh, an item you put in the shade of the moon. And you take the temperature of the shade of the moon, and then you take the the temperature of what is in moonlight, you will find that the temperature of the item in moonlight will be several degrees lower than the temperature in the moon shade, which is just the opposite of what you would expect. Right. Now, right. you know that in sunlight, and I've done this, I've actually taken the thermometer out and I've done it, I've, I've found that between the, the difference between the moon shade and moonlight is about two degrees Fahrenheit. So the temperature in the moon shade was actually two degrees to six degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, greater in moon shade than it was in moonlight. It, it's a cold light, which we know that that cannot be reflecting the light of the sun because, and again, having to make sure about this because we know that sunlight is hot, it's warm, and you want to get in the shade to get out of the heat. Um, during the day, it was about a 20 to 25 degree Fahrenheit difference between the shade and the sunlight. It was hotter by 20 to 25 degrees in sunlight. So we know that the moon cannot be reflecting the light of the sun because in order to do that, it would have to reflect a warm light. But it doesn't. It reflects a cold light. So it is its own light and has different character. Okay. And... <laughs> Well, here's one for you. Here's one. I don't know if you saw this. I'm standing exactly at sea level, and the moon is just coming up over the edge of the Atlantic, and the moon is 100% full, and it's bright, bright orange. So I took the camera, and I took a compass. I point the compass and the camera at the moon, and then I turn around 180 degrees to show where the sun just set one hour ago. If what they tell us was true, the sun just set, so between the sun and the moon, which they claim is reflecting the sunlight, the earth is now in the way. 
So if they're if they're in from if what they were telling us was correct, the Earth should be casting a shadow on the moon. We shouldn't have a completely one hundred percent full moon, and it's exactly what we had. Do you yeah, know that's what I'm saying? That's a really good point. Yes. I, I, I got it. I, I did it with you in mind, and I did it very, very succinctly. With the, it was freezing out, but it seems like when it's really cold out, that's the best time to get the footage. The, the sun just set exactly 180 degrees exactly behind me an hour prior, and the moon is coming up over the Atlantic as big and bright as it could possibly be. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I. Um, I have actually done some research on that because when you think about it logically, anytime you have a full moon, if the moon is reflecting the sun, that would mean the earth necessarily has to be in direct line with the sun, therefore blocking the moon, and you could never have a full moon. Now, they have figured, they, they realize that's a problem. So what they do, okay, they, I'm talking about science so-called, is they made up a five degree offset of the in the um, uh, the rotation of the of the moon around the earth. So it's five degree offset. So they say in that five degrees, they actually get the sunlight past the earth. Now uh, that's their that's their explanation. That's what they're going with. But having said that, having said that, if you think about it logically, in our solar system. If you have, have a heliocentric model where the Earth is revolving once every 24 hours, we know that. We're just going to take that as a given, right? So every 24 hours, the where you are on Earth is right back to where you were, if, if in fact what they say is true, right? So it's at once every 24 hours, exactly. And then you have the Earth uh, in a circuit around the sun, according to the heliocentric model. Well, the problem with that is in six months, in where you're facing at high noon will be midnight six months later. If you can envision that. Yes, I laid this that, out. That really, that really screws up all their all their models. It really it does. does. That's a great It does, point. but nobody, nobody discusses this. Okay. I lay it out in my book. I've got a chapter where I illustrate. You can see the illustration, and I have the authorities. Uh, where I established that, in fact, under the heliocentric model, it's basically impossible. It's an impossible model, and this is a fly in the ointment. They, there's no way they can they can establish the heliocentric model and have the have high noon uh, six months later at, at the same spot. It just doesn't work. Yeah, that's 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 brilliant. There's, there's there's some guys at NASA right now cursing your name because of that because they're trying to figure out a formula to to kind of bull stuff their way around that. You know what I mean? <clears throat> yes. Now let's let's move on here. So we have the we have light the, the moon giving off its own light. All right. Now, if you look at Genesis uh, verse uh, chapter one verse two, it says that the Earth started its existence without form and void. And God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, isn't that interesting? It's the face of the waters. Now, a face is a flat surface, the face of a clock. See, it's a flat surface. It's the front of something. A globe, a sphere does not have a face. We don't talk about the face of a basketball, okay? You have a face, all right? Uh, that is the front. That is the that is the surface of something. So he talks about the and we all know that water is always flat. Okay, we talk about water level. Okay, because water is always level and it seeks its own level. So the idea that that the the water has some kind of hump uh, that would be necessary on a globular Earth is mythology. We know it's flat. Okay. Now, um, in Isaiah forty four twenty four, okay, he says he spread out things that you. Uh, he, he said he stretches forth the heavens, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. So he stretches out the heavens. He spreads abroad the earth. Well, you spread something that's flat. You stretch the heavens about uh, over something that's flat. 
Okay, so a bed spread is flat. You're talking about spreading something out that's flat. Okay, now and with regard to the firmament, he said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. So the firmament is a hard, um, in this case, we're talking about a hard dome-like uh, structure because in Job 37, 18, it's described as, um, uh, hast, thou, um, hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass. So basically a firmament is like a molten looking glass. And when the, the firmament divides the waters that are above from the waters that are beneath. So when you look up, up in the sky, that blueness you're seeing is actually water above the firmament. Okay. And when God flooded the earth in the Genesis flood, uh, in, it talks about in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, that he opened the windows of heaven. See, so that's the, the some of the waters came from the from the windows of heaven. OK. Yeah. Now, now, interesting, if you look in Psalms 136, 6, OK, it, it said it says to him that stretches out the earth above the waters for his mercy endureth forever. Now think about that. He stretched the earth out above the waters. Well, you're thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute. The earth is not above the waters because we know that the, the earth is above, you know, uh, uh, th that the oceans are, are separate from the earth, right? What we call earth. What does that mean? Well, guess what? Science knows this, but they won't tell you. And you can do your own research. Uh, they have discovered that beneath the ocean, they have found hypersaline um, pools. That's right. That are so dense that are so dense that um, one person was in a, uh, a sub, uh, one of those submarines, uh, exploratory submarines, and they went to go in it. It was like a lake underneath the ocean. It actually, you can see the lapping of the hyper. It's upon the waters, the super saline solution. Those are the foundations of the earth. Right. And that was, uh, those are the guys that were filming for the Blue Planet, and they went under. They were under the water, and they came across a lake. When they were, I mean, they were in the. They were really, really deep under the ocean, and they filmed it. There's a lake. You can see the waves lapping the surface. I mean, there's a yep. lake under the ocean. Wrap your yep. mind around that. You know, this is crazy stuff. And you'd think that this would be front page news, and it isn't. No, no. And, you know, um, it, if you look, if you do research, you'll find that there are other pools under the ocean that they have discovered, but you really have to dig to find it. Um, yeah, they're not, they're not making it easy anymore. In the last couple of years, the Google searches, all this stuff, you you have to really really be specific when you search for stuff because they're simply cover they're rewriting history basically using the computers to do so. Yes, yeah they scrub and uh, that guy he suffered a mysterious death and I don't know what the circumstances were some years later. Uh, the guy who explained and I, I don't know if, if there was anything nefarious about that or not but some people have alleged. All right, but now which, uh, which guy on, are you talking about, Edward? The, the guy, guy who narrated that, the guy who narrated that and explained what he saw. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> he, was a, he was a he was a young guy. I can't remember his name. I can't either. But he's since deceased. But anyway, uh, you know, if you, if you look through the Bible, it talks about the the circle of the earth in Isaiah forty twenty two. Uh, it is he that sits upon the circle of the earth. Okay. Now, a circle is a two-dimensional scribe. In fact, God makes it clear that he encircled the seas with a boundary, Okay, that he encompassed the seas with a boundary. In Proverbs uh, 8.27, I was there when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. That's wisdom talking. Okay, that's God, essentially. When he set the compass upon the face of the depth. So he, uh, hold on just a second. And it says, I was there when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. So a compass is a, uh, a circular boundary. Okay, it can also be a measuring instrument, but it's a circular boundary. It has many, many definitions. So 
uh, that, that circular boundary is what we see in the flat earth with Antarctica around the outside. Okay. And notice that he says it's the face of the depth. Okay. So he set a compass upon the face of the depth, again, indicating a flat surface facing up. Okay. And he said, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Well, having a ball floating around in in, uh, in space doesn't sound like much of a footstool. Right. And, and it's, when it's, you look at the, the just to go back upon the, the the terminology circuit, when you look at the, the the model that they give people, that it's commonly accepted that the you know the Earth's going thousand spinning a thousand miles an hour, sixty six thousand miles around. That's no circuit. That's just a spiral that's spinning off into oblivion. It yeah. makes little to no sense, but people just don't think about it. A circuit right. applies. Right. You know what I'm saying? It, I think you nailed that one, man. Yeah. And he looks at all the inhabitants from his throne in heaven, which suggests one location above us. Okay. Now, they might think, well, God's all powerful. He can He can do whatever he wants. If he wants to see around the other side of the goal. Well, that's true. Uh, that's true. He is all powerful. He can do what he wants. But, you know, why? why is he depicting something that doesn't really exist. That means that he's telling us a fib? I don't think so. And also, the Satan is not all powerful. So when, when the devil tempted Jesus and he wanted to show him all the kingdoms of the, of the earth, he took him to a high mountain. Well, no matter how high the mountain is, if all the kingdoms of the earth are on a globe, he wouldn't be able to see around the backside of the globe. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? that's, a, that's a great one right there. Yeah. And another thing, when when Jesus returns, everyone will see him in the sky. OK, so in Revelations 1, 7, it says every eye shall see him. Well, how is every eye going to see somebody coming in the sky when it's a globe? The people on the backside won't be able to see him coming. All right. Now, people say, well, again, God is he will do it in some miraculous way. Um and in fact, who was it that ran the uh, that, that 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 charlatan who ran uh, the Trinity uh, Broadcasting Network? I can't remember his name. And he said, "Well, God was going to use the Trinity Broadcasting Network to make sure everybody in the world saw when He came." Yeah, that's ridiculous. Okay. Now, how, what's the and, and and what what's the refutation of this idea that God's going to use some other miraculous way? Well, if you read Acts chapter one nine through eleven. It says when when Jesus was ascended into heaven, the um, uh, the angel said, uh, "In like manner shall he so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven." So basically, saying as you're watching him ascend into heaven, he's coming back the same way. You're going to see him the same way. All right. So you're talking. We're talking flat Earth here. It's got to be flat Earth. You know what really gets me? It to 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 read the Bible, to look at what you to look at what you're presenting right now, and to look around. Everything makes sense. When you look around, you see everything is flat, except for mountains and hills and so forth. When you see the sun and moon moving around, it all makes sense. NASA has come in and literally brainwashed people where they have to suspend reality to understand what NASA is presenting. It's, it's, to me, it looks like it's common sense. The Bible explains things, and when you look around, it all lines up with what the Bible's saying. Yeah. What NASA is saying, you have to, you have, it's complete and utter faith. You see a rocket on a launch pad, and then they claim it shoots off into outer space, and then everything else is, you know, artist conceptions and broadcasting and green screens. It just amazes me how much they, they've been able to take over everything with television and words. D does that make any sense? I'm trying to get a point. Yeah, here. yeah. No, the population, the population has been conditioned and they control the media con to continue that conditioning process. It's amazing. It's amazing. It, it, it astounds me that more people aren't wondering why there hasn't been another Mickelson Morley. Like, why isn't one of these done every single day until somebody can prove in a scientific fashion where it's repeatable that the earth is moving at a specific <laughs> speed? Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it just amazes to me. It's, well, they can't scientifically prove what does not exist. That's why. Say that and one Michael more time. 
They cannot scientifically prove what does not exist. Right, right. Well, no, that, that's so the they, they have to use they have to use propaganda. Oh yeah, they it's it's yeah. Michaels and Morley, the Michaels and Morley experience uh, experiment established proof beyond any doubt that the Earth is stationary and it does not move. And like I said, when we were off air, it's the very first thing when you type in Michaels and Morley experiment, the first thing you th see is the greatest failure in science, the greatest failure. It wasn't a failure. They their their experiment worked perfectly. The only failure is it didn't it, it failed to detect the spinning of the earth because the earth isn't spinning. That's right. In my opinion. Right. That's right. You're absolutely right. That's what it did. I mean, it, it, it established that. And, and for a long time, the scientific community uh, was on tilt. They didn't know quite what to make of that because they could not attack Michelson um, or Morley. Michelson was the, the foremost physicist of his time. And they couldn't attack his methods, his experiment, because the interferometer that he that he created uh, was in, it was very accurate, very precise, and they they could not attack his methodology. They were left scratching their head, and so that's when they trotted out Einstein in his theory of relativity, who basically said, "Well, the reason no motion was shown is because everything's relative." And when you're looking at things from your perspective, then you think that you're not moving and the other objects are moving when in fact you really are. OK, so he created a mythology and called it a science. It's really a religious philosophy of relativity. And they said, well, yeah, but what about uh, what about the firmament? I mean, the firmament should be an objective standard, even though your perspective might be wrong. This is a this is light. This is light traveling through a, through a firmament. I'm sorry, um, uh, the ether. Uh, you know, they said, what about the ether? It's traveling through the ether. We know the ether exists. He said, no, it doesn't. No ether. Okay, so he just said that there's no ether. And from then on, people have accepted the fact there's no ether, even though ether has been a, a proven. It's a proven fact. So the theory of relativity is completely impeached, but yet they still teach it in schools as though it's a scientific fact when it's really a religious philosophy that's clothed in scientific lingo. Well, and it's all it's mathematics. Just, it's not physics. It's mathematics. Right. The, the, the <laughs> Morley experiment was actual science. It was actual hardware science. They, it, was, it was testing. It was science in the purest form. And then when they couldn't come up with an answer, they bring in a theory. And then that seems to, I mean, it's, it's funny because now black is white and white is black, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, here's a here's a test that we can't refute. So let's just bury it and bring a theory up. So when you fall down, you're not actually falling down. The earth is coming up and hitting you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's equally it's equally likely. There's no scientific way. They say this is what they say. There's no scientific way to determine whether you fell to the ground or the ground came up and hit you in the nose. Is that idiotic or it's what? It's ridiculous. It's laughable, yeah. and yet this is what's and it's it's ending up in the science books in schools. This is what yes. they're teaching them. Yes, we're the last of the Mohicans, Edward. Yes. <sighs> All right, you want to take a break? And uh, in Job, God makes the point that He has snapped a line. Okay, so He says that I laid the foundations of the earth. Okay, and who hath stretched the line upon it? So this is in Job, uh, chapter 38, verses 4 to 13. And so, and he, and he talks in the end, in verse 13, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. So how do you take holds of the ends of something that's spherical, not possible? And when you snap a line, everybody knows that when you stretch a line, talking about snapping a line, when you're doing construction, in order to have line, you take a chalk line, you pull it tight, you snap it, and you get yourself a line. That's what we, what, that's what people do who are in construction in order to have a straight line. You can't have a straight line on a sphere. That's right. Okay? It's got to be a, it's got to be a flat earth. Um, in Revelation 6 through 13, we have the stars, okay, uh, falling to the earth. Now, if the stars are supposed to be suns, okay, as they claim, then, then we, then we have a problem because that means that any single star, okay, would engulf 
the earth if it fell to the earth. Okay, and 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 we know that that can't happen if if that prophecy is to be uh, uh, taken at at face value. Okay, so again, God pours water upon the face of the earth. We see that in Amos nine six. Okay, um, we again uh, make. Uh, if you look at Job chapter uh, 38 through 14, uh, talking about the earth, it's turned as clay to the seal. Now, a seal, okay, uh, we use wax, you can use clay, you put a stamp on it, it's on a flat surface, that seal is flat, okay? And when turning means to form, okay? And it's interesting that, that the word turn is found uh, in the Bible to describe forming the shape of the seal. So the, the description of turned as clay to the seal clearly describes a flat earth, okay? And it suggests by the word turn that it's a circle, okay? Now, it, it, again, moving on to Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 13, God caused the sun and the moon to stand still. And interesting, when you look at those verses, uh, in Joshua 10, uh, verses 12 through 13, you'll see that the sun stood still upon Gideon. Uh, I'm sorry, Gideon. So you have the sun standing still upon Gideon, upon a particular location, and the moon stood still in the valley of Ajalon. Well, if the, if the sun is supposed to be millions of miles away and many times greater than in size than the earth, how could it be upon Gibeon? See, so th this idea that the, the sun is so much larger than the earth uh, is, is a fallacy according to what the Bible states. And also, they, the sun and the moon did stand still. And that's what the Bible says, that they stood still. The Bible does not say that the earth stopped spinning. So, excuse me, I'm going to cough. <laughs> All right. God states clearly in the, um, by the way, are you able to edit out that cough? It states clearly in the passage that the sun stood still. It does not say the earth stopped spinning. And by the way, if the earth would stop spinning, think about it. You have the earth spinning at a thousand miles per hour at the equator and it comes to a sudden stop. Well, it would kill every living thing on earth. There's just no way that that would be possible. It's and so it has to have happened. It's amazing how many lies we're living in at once. Just like you just said, according yeah. to NASA, the, the sun is multitudes larger than the earth when that's absolutely, completely and totally false by a lot. Yeah. The earth is spinning at a thousand miles at the equator. That doesn't make any sense at all, because if that was a true thing, a thousand miles an hour on a sphere, 7,000 <laughs> plus miles in diameter, <clears throat> the speeds would vary. It's just, it's so ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yeah. And people laugh at us for trying to bring the truth forward. Yeah. You know, and you, 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 um, you have this guy, uh, Michael Hoger, who he has, um, he's gone on and, and he, he thinks that it's now his mission to establish that the, we live in a heliocentric system according to the Bible. And the only, the only Bible passage that he can cite as his authority is Obadiah chapter one, verse four. And in that passage, it's talking about uh, the pride of Edom. And it's, here's what it says. And this is his argument for the fact that we have a heliocentric system. He says, thou, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, Thence I will bring thee down, saith the Lord. So basically he's saying this is a foreshadowing of what NASA is doing by going into the stars, that, that man, man will be among the stars. Well, he doesn't understand, he doesn't understand English, okay? So be, to be among the stars, all right, means that you're surrounded by the stars. And also, it, it, it doesn't mean that you're in with the stars. He, he suggests that the eagle is going to be with the stars. Well, this is, he talking, God is using a simile and he's, he's comparing eagles and nests. Well, eagles, everybody knows eagles do not go into outer space and they don't make their nest in outer space with the stars. No, they make their nest in mountains. 
okay? And they are surrounded by the stars. When you look at their nest, surrounded by the stars that are, that are above them. That's what is being depicted here. So the word among doesn't mean with the stars, like they're right next to the stars. That's not what it means. And so, but that's how he interprets this. And he just, and that's the only thing he has. So he rides that horse till it dies. Um, but that's the only <laughs> argument. Uh, charlatans who claim to be Christians who are going to come out, these pastors, and try to establish that we have a heliocentric system. Um, and Hogart is one of them. Well, I really appreciate your time, and I hope you're getting, I hope you're feeling better very soon. The greatest lie on earth, proof that our world is not a moving globe, is a phenomenal book, and it's available a, a variety of different ways, and all the links will be in the description as they were last time. Edward, I appreciate your time. Do you want to leave us with any uh, words of wisdom other than the ones you've already given us? No, just be just be aware that you have to have the full armor of God, okay, um, which includes uh, you have to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and that is important. You have to always speak the truth. Beautiful. Edward, enjoy the week. I hope you're feeling better, and I really appreciate you coming back on with us. Thank you. Anytime. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.